Thank you very much, Speaker, for this uh, great um, introduction, and thank you for inviting me to uh, present my talk on uh, the management of celiac disease in children. Uh, that's a very different talk. It's very uh, clinical. It's very practical. We see lots of kids with um, uh, celiac disease, uh, so you're not going to hear a lot of basic science, I'm afraid. <laughs> it's a mainly clinical talk about management of celiac disease in children. Um, there is a bit of changes over the last few years uh, in the way how we diagnose uh, celiac disease and uh, we, I will I'll, uh, talk about it um, and this is mainly the European perspective. So um, my talk, again, con uh, the content is about the definition of celiac disease, a bit of uh, epidemiology, pathophysiology, who do we test and uh, how do we test and some um, treatment and prevention uh, discussion. So, um, celiac disease, as we know, is immune-mediated uh, systemic uh, disorder, so it's not only GI disorder, it's a systemic disorder, and it is elicited by exposure to gluten, which is mainly the gliadin part of the gluten, in genetically susceptible uh, patients. So, these are the patients who have HLA-DQ2, 95% uh, of patients HLA-DQ2 positive, and 5% uh, HLA-DQ8 positive. So if you don't have HLA-DQ2, DQ8, you're not having celiac disease. So uh, this is just a little bit about the um, pathophysiology. Oh, sorry. I did the heart rate just don't talk. Yeah. So uh, you can see as uh, so the gliadin is here, and this is the transferring receptors that uh, attach to the gliadin and get through um, into the submucosa, and then it gets deaminated by the um, tissue transglutaminase, and then uh, this uh, compound, uh, if you are DQ2, DQ8 positive, you will have your major histocompatibility complex, the MSCH2, uh, on the antigen presenting cell and present this complex into your T helper cell, CD4, and this will generate a cascade of inflammatory response, and that's including the mature B cell, uh, which will present the IgA TTG, the killer T cell CD8, as well as uh, the uh, cytokine productions, including the um, tumor necrotizing factors and um, other products, which will damage your enterocytes and you will have the histological risk and the um, damage into your small bowel. So uh, we know now that more people are diagnosed with celiac disease, and we don't know whether this is because of the increased recognition of the disease or whether there is an epidemic of um, celiac disease. But we know that from studies in the UK, uh, and this is a serological markers being collected from normal population, that the prevalence of celiac disease is as high as 0.8%. Uh, so nearly 1% of the population has celiac disease. Actually, uh, the clinical diagnosis is only in 10% of those patients, so we are just getting the tip of the iceberg. So who do we test uh, in kids who have, uh, with, with celiac disease? Uh, we test the symptomatic children and we test asymptomatic children who had associated condition that raised the susceptibility for celiac disease. So symptomatic children is a very um, big umbrella of systematic children, and any child with problems might worth doing a celiac disease serology for. And for the GI perspective, you can see the diarrhea, abdominal pain, abdominal distension, and the celiac crisis, which we don't see that much nowadays, thankfully. Um, so any GI symptoms, even lactose intolerance, you need to think about celiac disease. Um, malabsorption related, so any child who had a short stature, you need to check for his celiac serologies, uh, children with uh, osteoporosis, fractures, unexplained iron deficiency anemia, weakness and tiredness. Um, so miscellaneous uh, other causes, and uh, one of them which I really uh, like to um, to focus on is the uh, unexplained trans, uh, tra raised transaminitis. So if you have raised liver enzymes, uh, please don't forget to check for celiac serology. Delay puberty as well as uh, being documented in uh, children with celiac disease. So asymptomatic patients, so those are patients who had uh, 
risk of developing celiac disease. So there's 10% chance of developing celiac disease in type 1 diabetes, 7% chance in selective IgA deficiency, and 10% in Down syndrome and other syndromic uh, autoimmune thyroiditis, JIA, IgA nephropathy, and autoimmune liver diseases. So all these patients, you need to uh, think of celiac disease in your, in your follow-up with them. Uh, relatives of celiac disease, and um, as you can see, 30% of the match sibling, HLA match sibling have a celiac disease, and 70% of the monozygotic twins. So, um, how do we test? Uh, this is quite similar to the adult. We check with cel celiac serology, endoscopies, and duodenal biopsies, as well as HLA tissue typing. And HLA tissue typing is really important in the asymptomatic patients because it helps to stratify those patients. For uh, the blood testing, and as you know, uh, you need to have um, a, a, good va a good number of IgA level in order to uh, elicit uh, IgA tissue transglutaminase. Uh, keep in mind, it's a very sensitive test, but it's not very specific, so you can have raised tissue transglutaminase and other causes, such as in thyroid problems or in um, Crohn's disease, etc. So it is, but it is very sensitive. Um, whereas the endomycel antibodies is the other way around, it is very specific. So if you have IgA endomycel antibody positive, uh, it is very likely this is celiac disease, nothing else. So we like to combine both of them when we do our serology. If you are IgA deficient, then you can do the IgG, tissue transglutaminase, or endomycel antibodies. Uh, having said that, it's not as specific and sensitive as per the IgA endomycel antibodies. And in frank, if you have a good, um, like if you have symptoms and you have IgA deficiency, I think uh, biopsy is the gold standard. So, um, the European Society of Pediatric Gastroenterology issued their guidelines, and this is a bit of a um, difference from how we used to um, diagnose celiac disease before. So if you have a child who is symptomatic with tissue transglutaminase more than 10 times the upper limit of normal, with a positive genetic testing, i.e. either your HLA DQ2 positive or DQ8 positive, with positive anti-endomycial antibodies, so if you have all these together, then you can get the diagnosis of celiac disease and avoid biopsy. Um, and actually, there's a wide group of patients that qualify for that. And in one of the study, up to 60% of the pediatric patients um, can have um, tissue transglutaminase 10 times upper limit of normal with positive genetic testing and positive endomycel antibodies. If all these there, it is very sensitive, and it is 99.9% these children have celiac disease. So you don't need really to put them under general anesthetic and do the, um, the genome biopsies. So uh, this is the British Society guidelines. So um, as we said, so initial screening, this is symptomatic patient. Um, so if you are, if your tissue transglutaminase, number one, if you are tissue transglutaminase negative and your uh, IgA normal, then it is unlikely you have celiac disease. You don't need to have an endoscopy. However, if you are, your tissue transglutaminase raised, but less than 10 times the upper limit of normal, then you do qualify for endoscopy. If you are tissue transglutaminase 10 times the upper limit of normal and, um, and, and then uh, you either perform the endoscopy or you go for the blood testing, with it, which is the genital, genetic testing as well as the endomycel antibodies. And if they are positive, you qualify for the diagnosis. And to be frank, when we offer that to patients, all parents prefer to have a blood testing rather than endoscopic assessment because no one wants to put their kids under GA for no reason. And um, so if you are IgA deficient, uh, you can either do the IgG um, antibodies, but it is less specific with low threshold for biopsies. So if, you are a if your child had one of um, the associated factors, so the child doesn't have symptoms, but he has type 1 diabetes or IgA deficiency or trisome 21, or a member of a family uh, who had um, uh, celiac disease, 
then you have an initial screening and you do the genetic testing. So if you are, you have the gene, i.e. you have, um, if you don't have, sorry, the gene, which are, you, you are not at DQ2 or DQ8 uh, positive, then you're not gonna develop celiac disease. So uh, that's far enough, fair enough, and don't um, do any further screening. However, if you are DQ2 and DQ8 positive, but your tissue transglutaminase is negative, you don't have celiac disease, but you are susceptible for celiac disease, so you need to check on a three yearly basis um, if, you have, if you develop antibodies for these uh, high-risk patients. And the, it's a bit complicated, so if, you're, if you are DQ2, DQ8 positive with your tissue transglutaminase less than three times upper limit uh, of normal and your endomycial antibody is um, positive, then you need to have a duodenal biopsy. And, um, and the same for the last one. So if, if you are asymptomatic, you have to have a, and you have some positive serology, you have to have really um, an endoscopic assessment. So the one without endoscopic assessment only qualify if you are a symptomatic patient. Duodenal biopsy, I think this is quite similar to the adult. It's important to have multiple biopsies, including, um, so what we recommend in our hospital, two biopsies from the duodenal bulb and four biopsies from D2, D3. And uh, we made, um, we published recently about our diagnosis of celiac disease. Uh, we managed to get 21 of our cases only showed a uh, histological finding on the duodenal bulb. So that's really important to include uh, the duodenal bulb when you do biopsies. Uh, the modified MARSH uh, grading of histology, just a bit of a reminder. So uh, type one, uh, MARSH one is not a diagnosis for celiac disease. Um, and you just really need to keep monitoring those patients, but obviously the others are. This is a bit of the histology, a reminder. So this, the, um, oh. sorry. So this is the uh, normal appearance of the villi, and this is the uh, flattened uh, villi with the crypt hyperplasia and the infiltration of inflammatory cell as well as the intraepithelial lymphocytosis, the characteristic of MARSH 3C criteria. Um, remember, differential diagnosis for villus atrophy, include in, especially when you have serology negative disease, things of um, other causes such as GRDL infestation, autoimmune enteropathy, um, Crohn's, common variable immune deficiency, and other non gluten dietary protein allergies. So, as we um, Chatted earlier, HLA DQ2, 95% of celiac patients, and HLA DQ8 in 5%. And um, if you have the code for this gene, you will present the major histocompatibility type 2, which activate your T cell lymphocytes. So if you don't have it, you're not going to develop celiac disease. So um, in practice, when we check for uh, the, when we do the genetic testing, as we said, in asymptomatic patients, and sometimes in MARSH1 patient, when you have seronegative, but you're not, you have a bit of suspicion, it's worth really doing genetic testing. Uh, in patients who are already on gluten-free diets, um, because probably they have wheat intolerance also, and they are not so keen to go into a normal diet and you want to say whether they have celiac disease or not, it's worth doing the genetic testing. And if you have a discrepancy between your serology and histology, or in cases of patients who are IgA deficient and negative serological marker, I think genetic testing is help to stratify those patients. So uh, just a reminder, if you are HLA DQ2 positive or, uh, or DQ8 positive, um, 20 to 30% of the population have this gene. So it's only, but if you, if you are negative, your, your predictive value of having the genes is, is, is more, negative predictive value of having the genes is more than 99%. So you're not gonna develop it. 
obviously treatment uh, till now uh, is only the lifelong gluten free diet. Uh, think about lactose intolerance in children and lots of our kids who had MARSH 3C criteria, they do have lactose intolerance and we do sometimes put them on lactose free diets uh, if they are severely um, atrophied villi. Um, we do counsel our patients and uh, benefit of a gluten-free diet. Even if they are asymptomatic, there's improvement of their bone demineralization. If you are puberbiltal, um, you uh, reduce your rate of delayed puberty and um, the uh, recurrent abortions and low birth weight. Uh, reduce bowel cancers uh, by 8% for small bowel cancers and four times for colonic cancers. Um, and prevent the onset of other autoimmune diseases. Uh, follow up, we follow up the children. Obviously, our pediatrician growth and nutrition is very important. We check the nut their nutrient levels and we check their serology to ensure compliance. Usually, most of our patients who are well compliant, they no their autoantibodies normalize in the first year of life. Uh, our dietitian review our patient as well to ensure the gluten-free diet and answer any queries. We have our annual review. It's of interest that there is a recent study showing that children who are on gluten-free diet have less balanced diet, and uh, probably this is because of um, compensation of going into co uh, gluten-free diet. So dietetic input will be helpful in that as well. So um, this is quite a common scenario. The patient say we are on gluten-free diet, but they're still symptomatic, what's going on? Um, obviously it's important to revisit your diagnosis, revisit your slides and your serological marker prior to the diagnosis. But if it is a true celiac disease, lots of our patients are non-compliant and um, we monitor that with a serological marker and then uh, further um, education and um, dietetic inputs. Think of transient lactose intolerance, think of exocrine and pancreatic enzymes insufficiency, and that's quite common in significant celiac disease. So we measure um, fecal elastase, and if this is raised, we consider give them some um, pancreatic exocrine um, replacement therapy, which helps with um, their symptoms. Uh, they might develop other causes, such as colitis or so, so keep your mind open. Think of other autoimmune disease for children with uh, abdominal pain, and we have a few patients who had adrenal insufficiency because we know there is a correlation with autoimmune diseases. So think of thyroid, so think of adrenal gland um, if patients have symptoms. Refractory celiac disease is quite common, it, like it's, it's quite uh, recognized in adults, thanks goodness we don't have much of it in um, children. Um, there is only a few case reports and we definitely haven't come across refractory celiac disease. Um, regarding the prevention of celiac disease, um, you uh, think about, uh, there's, there's few studies which show that if you are exposed to uh, wheat during the time when you were uh, breastfeeding that your chance of developing celiac disease is less than uh, a child who is bottle fed and this is well documented in few studies. A gluten challenge, we usually use it if you have um, diagnostic uncertainty. So if you're not sure um, the child went into gluten-free diet without endoscopic assessment, then you should consider a gluten challenge after discussing with the patients. Before any gluten challenge, we do genetic testing to make sure that the child is genetic, has the genetic predisposition to celiac disease. So we expose the child to three grams per day of gluten for a period of six to eight weeks. Having said that, if the patient became symptomatic two or three weeks after, we do check serological markers and we do do the biopsies because we can see the damages if the patient is symptomatic. So refractory celiac, as we said, is very rare in children. Um, in adults, increase the risk of ulcerative jejunitis and T cell small bowel lymphoma. Uh, usually you see that their tissue transglutaminase is normal, but when you do endoscopic assessment, you can see the villus atrophy and intraepithelial lymphocytosis, and this is usually secondary to um, some um, abnormality in the regulation of intraepithelial lymphocytes and the CD3 um, markers, and um, usually these are some of them treated with steroid and some of them needed azathioprine. 
Um, this is the type one. The type two had uh, bad prognosis, and lots of them really ends up having T cell lymphomas. Non-celiac um, gluten hypersensitivity, and this is an umbrella which uh, we think it is a probably uh, a part of IBS-like syndromes. Uh, we don't, I th as a gastroenterologist, we don't believe much in it, but it is. Um, there are lots of patients developed symptoms on gluten and improvement without gluten. It's really important to make sure that the ch this child is not a proper celiac disease or they don't have I like IgE uh, type 1 hypersensitivity to the wheat. And once you exclude that, I think this is part of uh, IBS related symptoms. Uh, so of interest, uh, like the self-reported prevalence of allergy to weeds is 3.6% uh, in Europe. So that's quite high. And uh, the prevalence of IgE-mediated allergy to the wheat is only 0.1%. Um, and this is what they report to us, that abdominal pain, diarrhea, and improvement when they um, cut down the wheat. And we don't know whether this is just because they reduce the carbohydrate and the processed food, or whether this is um, a real intensity of syndrome, and um, it's not very well established yet. So just to end up my talk, um, always think of the duodenal bulb biopsies, essential in diagnosis, endoscopic diagnosis of pediatric celiac disease. In Europe, we have a selected pediatric patient who we can get the diagnosis without endoscopy. And genetic testing can be quite helpful, especially in uh, asymptomatic patients. Thank you. Uh, this is just a photo of the Peak District where um, close to my home. Thank you.